Hi everybody, how's it going? Everything good on audio you can hear and everything's going great? Fantastic. So uh, that's actually an all right segue into what we are talking about today because I, uh, if you don't know me, uh, uh, you might have seen a lot of the stuff I've been putting out on the internet um, because over the last year I've really dived into audio um, and video and, and creating content for the French horn for the internet through my social media page. Um, this has turned into a whole bunch of things um, in my orchestra, which I play in the New World Symphony. Um, I've started um, producing concerts with them and running a series called Live From Our Living Room, which is a fellow run concert, which I do all the audio and video producing. Um, I ran that concert for several uh, several performances, and then I have started doing all sorts of other video and audio work with the orchestra in addition to playing horn. So today's presentation um, is called the basics, recording basics for auditions and creating content. And I want to say that this presentation, of course, I am not a professional audio engineer, right? Um, my training has all been in French horn performance. Um, so there are a lot of things that I'm still learning and I learn new things every day. And this makes this job so fun um, and this process so fun. But what I can share with you is basically after a year of learning this, um, things I wish I had done differently, things I wish I had known right when I started um, and how to start uh, if you're just getting into this. So here are some basics for auditions and creating content. So um, a little bit about why that we should want to do this. Obviously, recording auditions um, is going to become a big, if it isn't already, it is going to become an even bigger part of our lives. Um, you know, obviously COVID-19 has shaked up so much, um, but thinking about the idea that you, you should be able to present your sound as best you can um, through the internet and to somebody who's not there. And uh, prelim auditions are going to start to require that, maybe more auditions for festivals have almost always required it. If they don't have a live option, it's a good thing to know how to do. So, and the other thing is that over the year of everybody else learning about all this stuff, people are starting to expect really high quality playing and recording. So learning how to record better um, is only going to present your music, which your fantastic music, even better. Learning how to do some basic recording is going to save you some money without having to hire an audio engineer for um, simpler work that you can do on your own. Obviously, um, if you're recording your solo album, don't try to do it on your own if you're new to it. But uh, for a lot of these auditions, you can save yourself some money uh, by learning to do it on your own. Um, building and controlling your online presence being online, being present, um, especially if you're looking into teaching or freelancing, having a presence where people can find you that's curated with high quality content that you like uh, is really important. And of course, making art in our own homes uh, has been the theme of this year, but it's still a great thing to know how to do, um, you know, learn how to make great art. So let's start with uh, hard hardware, audio hardware. Uh, basically, there are more or less, when we're talking about hardware, we're talking about microphones. Um, and this is like the most often asked question I get. What microphones do I use to record the French horn and what microphones should you use to record the French horn? So we'll just go over a couple of different types. Um, first off, there are USB microphones, which are any microphones that connect to your computer through USB. The most popular is the, um, the Blue Yeti, which I have right here. So it's got a, you know, it has a dial on the front to control the volume, and then it has a bunch of dials on the back to control gain. It's got the USB port on the bottom. Super easy to use, really, you know, not complicated to use, but also not a lot of flexibility with these machines. They kind of just plug and play. Uh, handheld recorders, um, these are your zooms that sort of record things for you. They usually have microphones on them, uh, but they might, you know, have inputs for other microphones as well. And then the last one are, I'm just going to call XLR microphones because they use an XLR cable. This is generally the professional level equipment. The, the microphone I'm using to speak to you right now uses an XLR cable. Um, there, there are so many varieties of these sorts of things, but the idea is that that is a microphone where you will need more equipment to make that microphone work, whereas the handheld recorder will work on its own to record, and the USB microphone will work with your computer, and sometimes even your phone. Uh, 
So when you're talking about microphones, one of the first things that you'll start to learn about microphones is the the basically how they pick up sound, right? What their their ear shape is, if you will. And there's basically three, there's a fourth one on here, but there's basically three, which is cardioid mode, um, which means that it picks up from the front of the microphone and doesn't pick up behind the microphone. Omnidirectional, it picks up everywhere. And then um, a really interesting one called bidirectional or a figure eight pattern. This is usually a combination of two microphones that are facing in opposite directions from each other. Uh, and then you, you'll see this, they, you know, they can, they reject sound from the side and there's all sorts of like technical audio stuff that can be done with these kinds of microphones. But, um, a good way to think about using them is like, if you were doing a podcast and you had two people that you were interviewing, you could put this microphone in between them and it would pick up those audios. Um, they get more, there's obviously like different shades of all of these. There's super cardioids and then there's some like flatter cardioids and there's all sorts of things like that. Um, but for our purposes, we're recording the French horn. The only microphones that you really should be worrying about are cardioid microphones. So um, the Yeti Blue has a cardioid setting. Um, most microphones that you're going to buy um, are going to be cardioid microphones. So those are the ones that you want to stick to. Omnidirectional um, and bidirectional um, will usually really high-end microphones will include options for those, um, but they're not necessarily the basic ones that you should be familiar with. And then it gets even more in-depth with the different kinds of XLR microphones there are. So um, basically there's four main types. There's dynamic microphones. Um, the classic pop singing microphone uh, is, a, is a dynamic microphone. These are super directional, um, which is why they're great for voices, especially in concert. Then there's the large diaphragm condenser microphone. Um, that's the microphone I'm using right here to talk. Um, these microphones are just, they have really big capsules that vibrate and pick up sound. Uh, and then they're uh, condenser microphones, which means that they're incredibly sensitive and they need extra power um, to actually vibrate and send the signal to your computer. Um, that's all the condenser part means. And then the small diaphragm condenser microphones are the little tiny pencil conductors. And I will just say right off the bat, I think there's a misnomer with these kinds of microphones because a lot of people will say, okay, you can't use a small condenser microphone to record brass. Um, and you, there's actually, you know, these microphones are usually used in pairs and they're used to capture like an entire room sound or a large ensemble. So to play like one French horn alone in a dry room, no, you probably wouldn't use this microphone. But to record a brass quintet, this is like the first thing that you would go to. Um, so these microphones are really important, even though um, brass instruments are loud instruments uh, and the small kind of misnomer can make people... Um, look away from them, but the good things to know about. And the last one are um, ribbon microphones and people absolutely love ribbon microphones and that's because they sound amazing. My only issue with them is that they are incredibly expensive. They sound great. They're probably the best microphone to use for brass playing, but to get a pair of them costs about $3,000 for a really good quality one. So uh, would love to use one one day, but not in my budget right now. Uh, and then I guess uh, one other thing that I wanted to add here, every microphone, just like the polar patterns up here, um, each microphone will probably also include what's called a frequency response chart, which is this sort of thing right here, the frequency in Hertz. So this will tell you how well the microphone picks up uh, different frequencies at different volumes. This is included in your manual for every single microphone uh, that you're going to buy. And you can you know, use that information to know how that microphone is going to sound. Uh, and the next thing is with stereo patterns. So I'm going through a lot of basic information here. Um, and what I what it was just like a little intermission here. All of this stuff that I'm kind of throwing at you is more so stuff to be aware that it exists so that as you start to get better at recording and producing your audio, you're looking out for these sorts of things and you're thinking about them as you're making purchasing decisions and recording decisions. Um, this is not to say that like you need to know everything about frequency response, everything about stereo patterns, everything about, you don't need to know all this stuff to get started, but these are the sorts of 
observations you want to be able to make as you start to record and get better at recording. So um, like I was saying with the two microphones, the small condensers that come in pairs, um, they're not just, you know, you can't just turn them on and, and record. You have to set them up into a stereo pattern to get a left and a right audio channel. Um, and so there's four, you know, different kinds. The most popular are going to be your XY um, pair and your ORTF pair. And then the other two, DIN is a really cool one that's easier to set up than ORTF, but it's not as wide. Um, and then AB, the reason why I included AB is because you'll often see people will set up just like, you know, regular microphones as AB, but they do need to be omnidirectional microphones, or at least they're usually omnidirectional microphones. Um, so this is the sort of setup that um, you see a lot when people will, it makes sense. You get your, you know, your two pencil condenser microphones. And the first thing you do is like, well, I'll just put them pointed at the object and I'll get them the same distance apart. And that actually does, um, that doesn't necessarily work as well for these microphones as it would if they were omnidirectional microphones, because these are cardioid microphones. Uh, so all of this stuff is just to say things that you should be aware of when you're purchasing microphones. But what do I actually recommend that you do? So if you're thinking about an audition, you want to buy one object that will record for you that you can use in a Zoom call or, a, or an online lesson, and that won't be too expensive to upgrade. And so the best product I think you can buy for, as your first microphone is this product right here, which is called the Zoom H6 or the H4N Pro, um, which is also good. And these, these Zoom recorders, I actually don't even have one. <laughs> I wish I could to show you but they are recorders, which means that they can capture audio on their own. You don't even need your computer. They're really easy to carry around and pack in your bag. Some might even fit in a horn case um, if you have a large enough horn case to do. And then it has their own microphones, which are these uh, cardioid XY pair microphones. Those are the two microphones pointing at each other up there. They sound great. They work great for horn. And then, uh, they also, on the sides, you can't really see it, but they have XLR inputs. So if you were then to upgrade to more expensive, higher quality microphones, you wouldn't then need to buy a whole bunch of extra equipment to get them to use uh, to work well. You could instead just um, use this device, the Zoom, and you would still work just fine. Um, you'll see like all sorts of people talking about audio interfaces, which we'll get into at some point, but buying something like a, a handheld recorder saves you that um that trouble you don't need to worry about it so much so fantastic let's go on to the next little bit which is about software um so having the equipment is not necessarily enough you have to have some way to process um that audio software and this is the part where people get i think a little you know it, it can be a little bit tricky to navigate this sort of stuff um, there's basically, you know, what we need to do is this is called a digital audio workstation. And basically what these things do is they um, let you record into them. So if you're using a USB microphone like the Yeti Blue, this is the software that you're going to use to actually record. They let you edit your audio, um, which, you know, people make entire, you know, CDs and albums. If you look up uh, Jacob Collier, uh, on YouTube. His demonstrations of Logic Pro are unbelievable. He did all of his Jesse albums in this software. And they make serious uh, recordings, but they also, you know, can do basic stuff for you, like trimming your audition recording to just have the parts that you need it. Um, and of course, you can all, you can make multi-track recordings. You can do everything you need to in Logic Pro um, or, or Audacity or Avid, whatever you're going to use. And then, of course, they um, let you export your audio by um, setting levels for broadcasting, making sure that it's loud enough, making sure that it's not um, distorting the recording. And then of course they let you man manage file types, which is not the most important thing in the world. Just use WAV files and you'll be fine. But um, they do have that functionality if you needed to coordinate with, you know, let's say a composer was um, working with you to, uh, you know, record a piece at a distance, you know, you could you would use these programs to make sure that all your file types and stuff are are correct and compatible and things like that. Basically, if you need to get started, 
Uh, Audacity is a great program to use. GarageBand is, is, is similar, but not as robust as Audacity. And Audacity is free. And then professionals, the, the standard, you know, industry standard is Avid Pro Tools. And Logic Pro, if you have a Mac, is also really great. Um, that's Logic is the one that I use. I do all of my stuff in Logic Pro. And, you know, there's so much you can go into with software um, that to really give a tutorial, uh, you know, about every single function and detail would take a little bit of time. And, of course, John Terman already has probably the most in-depth um, Logic Pro tutorial already out there. So you should check out his um, on YouTube. Um, it's actually one of the ones I used to start, and it's incredibly helpful. But there are some like little things you should know um, about recording in the software that will help you. So the first thing, when you're recording, your mezzo forte sound in your French horn should hit around negative 12 decibels. Um, even if you don't know exactly what a decibel is or the difference between decibel and decibel full scale, all that stuff, when you plug in your microphone and you see the meter going up and down, Generally, you want that to be around negative 12. Uh, if it's getting to, if you're playing, you know, just comfortably and it's way above that, you're going to run into trouble. And if it's too low, honestly, it's not a big deal if you're recording too quietly. Um, but it's certainly, it's certainly much worse if you're recording too loud. And then your loudest playing, your peaks should not be um, greater than negative six decibels. Once you start to get above negative six, you really run the risk of distorting your recording, which means that no matter how great it is, it's not gonna render correctly. It's gonna get that crackling sound. It's not gonna be a good time and you're gonna lose your recording. So negative 12 for most of your playing, negative six for your peaks. Um, this is something you set before you hit record. So you, you test all this stuff, you see where it's landing, you set the recording, and then too soft is much better than too loud, at least in this case. When you're doing um, multi-track recordings, just as a note, you'll be doing multiple tracks at negative 12, which means that all together, they're going to definitely hit above zero. So you'll have to make sure that you maneuver them all equally um, as you're doing that sort of thing. If you're recording for video, you need to make sure that you are sitting at a sample rate of 48 kilohertz. So there's a lot of technical stuff in your digital audio workstation settings that you'll need to find. But one of the most important is the sample rate of your recorded audio. This basically is like, um, it's how often the computer is, is actually recording the audio that you see. And this one is 48,000 kilohertz. So 48,000 times a second, um, or 48,000 Hertz, sorry. Um, it is, is checking, uh, to, to record the audio. But you need to have this setting, especially if you're doing video. Um, this is one of those things where learning about stuff on YouTube is actually um, not the best way to learn things because in professional like audio editing and audio world, audio engineering, they generally stick to 44.1 kilohertz. That's the industry standard. Um, so unless you're specifically looking for how do I do audio with video and an audio video component like most audition recordings might need to be now, um, especially for festivals, you're not going to find this information very readily. But this is the reason why some people have syncing issues between their audio and video because the video and the audio are at different sample rates. Um, and just setting your recorder, whether it's your recorder, your Zoom recorder, um, or your Logic Pro or your digital audio workstation, making sure that's set at 48 kilohertz, I'm gonna repeat that number one more time, um, will probably solve your sync problem right away. Um, however, none of this matters nearly as much as microphone placement and room adjustment. Um, it, honestly, if you're worrying about anything, everything we just talked about, you can figure out, but placing your microphone and getting a right, the right sound before before you hit record uh, is much more important. Um, it's a much bigger deal in that respect. So how do you actually do that? Um, how do you actually set up your room to record? Well, the magic number <laughs> is the socially distanced number, which is six feet away. So if you are recording the French horn, even in a really live room, uh, keeping the microphone about six feet away is, is usually pretty good. And then the worse the room sounds, the closer you're going to bring that microphone. 
because like my you know this this bedroom doesn't really sound that great um so the microphone when i record is actually really close it's almost like two feet away right in front of the bell um but that's paired with still microphones that are six feet away and are capturing you know the whole french horn sound six feet is just kind of the general that's where i would start you know start right there if it sounds too close too present or if you want more reverb you can you know you can push it back push it further away but six feet is generally the best place to start and then a spot microphone so this is a microphone that is designed to be really close um this is you know this is usually two feet away right in front of the bell um i don't know too much about this but you know in studio recordings for example um you know there's a there's always a famous kind of story urban legend it might be true it might not i don't know that um the reason why the con 8d was sort of the la studio horn was because when you put a microphone really close to a con 8d it kept so much of its really warm sound that it was famous for that's why it was preferred by la musicians um in, in the you know in the recording studios and that comes from this idea of like in a, in a recording booth you're obviously you can't microphone you can't mic every single player ideally right you have mostly the the room the room recordings that are getting the full orchestra and you have these spot mics for everybody that are as close and as detailed as you can get um, and those are generally pretty close so if you you start with the spot microphone um you probably if you're just starting out, you probably don't need to worry about the spot mic, but if you do want to do it about two feet away from the bell level, uh, two feet away at the level of your bell, so pretty close to the ground. Um, when you close mic something, you're getting rid of the room sound. And my ideal setup, um, and what I use, what I was describing earlier, is I take these two microphones, my, my Rode M5s, which are the pencil condenser, pencil condenser microphones, I put them in an ORTF stereo pattern, you know, six feet away in front of me, pointed at the bell. And then I take this microphone, which is the Rode NT1A, and I put it about two feet away right in front of my bell um, at ground level. And then I mix the stereo recording that's in front of me uh, with just the single microphone. And that usually gets a pretty good sound. I'm really happy with it. Um, and it works pretty well. If I'm just in my room recording for like Instagram or a YouTube video that's just in my bedroom, sometimes I won't even use the two microphones in the back and I'll just use the one pointed at the bell. It gets a pretty good sound of the French horn. Um, this question might come up, so I'm just gonna answer it now. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a great idea to ever put the microphone behind the bell. Um, and Part of the reason for that is because you generally want to think of microphones as like ears um, and your microphone doesn't necessarily need to hear anything that your audience wouldn't necessarily want to hear. Um, so I don't think the sound that comes, you know, and our instruments are directional and that are reflective and that they, they, the sound that you want is the sound that comes off the wall and that's the sound you want to record. So even though that would get you like a really direct and, and good sound, um, I haven't found it in my playing in my maybe it's my setup my horn whatever that behind the bell is the best place to put the microphone just in front of the bell for a spot microphone seems to get more of the sound that I'm looking for um, it sounds more like like how I'm imagining I sound in my head at least any room can sound good and in fact every single room sounds unique um, and has its own qualities that you can exploit but there are some easy things that you can do. Um, the first thing that you can do is you lay down a rug dead in the room. You can also put sound panels on the wall or even use a bookshelf. Um, this is a set piece in my videos, but actually it does accomplish a really important audio function, which is that all of these books absorb a lot of the really harsh sound um, that the video, the, that recording creates, you know. Um, what's what's going on physically is that every time you play you know a note that note is a physical wave that's in the room and if you ever happen to play a note that was in a relationship with you know the length of your room right that was divisible by the length of the room you would get what's called a standing wave which would mean that like some random notes like i don't know like a b flat or something would ring 
much louder than every other note in your room. You're not really going to notice this with your ears because our ears are really good at just kind of like filtering that stuff out. But you would notice it. Your microphone doesn't care about that. It records everything at, you know, as if it were correct. So your microphone is going to pick up all those standing waves and you're going to get these recordings where you're thinking like, I don't rem like, why is that note sticking out? That note doesn't sound right. And it could be because you're playing in an untreated room where these standing waves are getting into your recording. But simple things like laying down a rug, um, you know, putting up curtains, putting up a bookshelf help a lot. Um, and then just a couple of, you know, things I found when I'm making audition recordings that a really live sound is actually not very useful. Um, it, it's actually good to have a somewhere in between. It's like it's got a lot of clarity in the sound. They the the um I don't know what's the word not judge a panel. I don't know. I can't remember what the uh, the word <laughs> for uh, committee. There we go. Sorry, the committee. You know wants to hear a lot of detail. Um, they don't want to hear like a really kind of like washed out sound, even if those acoustics are really nice where you would perform. Sometimes something closer with more detail is good. And if you're doing any kind of multi-track recording or you're recording um, for a uh, like like a distance recording that's going to be put together later with other people, you definitely need to use as dry a space as possible. And this is because some of those audio effects like a reverbs that are gonna make everyone sound like they're in the same room, the more reverb there already is in the recording, the harder it is to do that. Um, and even in my own recordings, when I put together multi-tracks of me playing over myself, I actually, in those cases, try to record um, just only with the spot mic, the most detailed and dry microphone I can and then I do all the reverb stuff later in post-processing um, instead of trying to you know make the room sound exactly the same even though I can even though I am in the same room of course every time that I'm doing that obviously recording is a process it's something you have to learn how to do and it's something you have to practice just as much as you practice the horn um, you are not going to you know, uh, become good at this overnight. You have to try and per and, and record without uh, the pressure, basically, of needing to turn something in. So first thing you do, experiment, experiment, experiment. Everything I've said so far um, about microphone placement and treating your room, sure, it could be correct, but you might have a better process. There might be something that sounds better for you, and you should find the best sound for the equipment in your space. Um, practice recording like you do a mock audition. Take out your horn uh, and your microphone equipment and practice setting everything up and then sitting down to play the audition. Incorporate that into your mock audition strategy. Incorporate that into your sort of performance preparation if this is the sort of thing um, that you're looking to use audio for. It really helps. Start with a complete take no matter what, especially if you're doing an audition. Uh, that might be the only complete take you get. And, or, and actually more often than not, at least with the people that I've been recording at the New World Symphony, it is so often that the first take is always the best one, especially when people are really prepared. And then they like think, okay, well maybe I'll do another take. Like I think I can do some things better. And then, you know, they'll, they'll say, yep, second take, that's the one. And then we'll go back into the audio booth and we'll listen to things and they'll say, actually, you know what? No, the first one definitely was it. That was the right take. So I, I think if you the first full complete take you can get is probably going to be a pretty good one. And you should always start by trying to get through the whole take um, at the very beginning. Might be your best. And the other thing, we obviously we play French horn, so you're only risking tiring yourself out and wearing down your face in the recording session. And then another thing that I think really helps when you have to record like a, an audition um, or even when, you know, you're recording, you know, for, for YouTube or for Instagram, leave the recorder running between takes and trim later in post. Yes, you do have to do more editing work because you have to take like, you know, a larger file that has five or six takes in it. But 
you don't have to sort of mentally restart the process of recording every time you don't have to get up out of your chair and click the stop button and then click the start record button and then sit back down and get ready to play again you're just sitting there you're recording it and then it just sort of happens uh, and these you know are this is also good practice if you're just recording your practice session you know leave the recorder running get used to having it in the room with you get used to leaving it on and uh it'll you know it'll become more comfortable to just know that you're being recorded i i really do think that'll happen i remember when i was at a summer festival uh, a couple years ago like the teacher there actually said like why aren't you recording all your practice sessions and i was like oh well you know i don't really want to go back and listen to them he's like no no no, it's so easy you just take a recorder and you put it somewhere and you just leave it on the whole time you're recording and it uh it really does it does help you know it it and then you've got you know gigabytes and gigabytes hours and hours and hours of your own playing already recorded um and sometimes you know you might get something good <laughs> in there your best take might happen while you're practicing and uh, that's never a bad thing you always want to have that moment um, and plus you know it doesn't help and the final thing about all this the number one rule of this stuff is if it sounds good it is good if you record yourself and you like how it sounds no matter what weird stuff you did with the microphone if it sounds good it is good um, so I'm going to take just a quick break here, and I'm going to invite you to ask any questions you have about the microphones, the audio stuff that we're doing. So I know a, kind of a, a basic breakdown, but I would love to just answer some questions about audio before we get into some video specific stuff. All right, so I will I will let you type those questions in and I will go on to video then. Actually, I think I do have a question. Maybe I do, yes. Any basic advice about mixing and EQ for solo tracks? So what I found, um, and especially with the, um, the engineers I have talked to, is that you, you generally aren't gonna be doing a lot of EQ um, for live classical music tracks. It really is about microphone placement and it really is about getting the room to sound the way you want. However, one thing I will say is if you don't have ideal recording equipment, you know, you're using microphones that aren't exactly great um, or aren't the best quality out there, one of those things that you can do is you can go to your um, frequency response chart here and you can find you know your frequencies like you know generally horn playing is going to be uh you know around like 200 hertz <laughs> to 600 hertz maybe um you know you can go in those areas actually probably to a little bit more because high c is is what like 700 and something hertz so you know that range of frequencies and see how it affects you so maybe for this microphone you can see it's going to be a little quiet and dip down there so it might be a good idea to go in and eq some of that out if it sounds bad um, you also can do some eqing to get rid of like what's called a, a high pass filter or a low pass filter um, if you have like an air conditioner running or a low buzzing you're generally not going to want to do too much eqing um, on your own sound you want to sound how you do if you do record um how do you edit and fix it at the right volume? Great. So you record too low. How do you edit and fix it the right volume? There's one button you have to push and it's called the normalize function. So in your digital audio workstation, you'll be able to click the track. And as long as it sounds good and it's right, you just click normalize and it will put it at um, the loudest volume it can without clipping the microphone. And this is a really good thing to know how to do because um, it, it you know it's it's one of those things where if you record too low and you do normalize you generally start to get some like um with like graininess or like some kind of weird audio effects in the sound but it's only if it's like really really too low 
Um, anything between like negative 25 to, to negative 12 will do sound just fine if you bump it up a little bit. Do you recommend the use of pop filters? Do I, <laughs> I should be using one right now for speaking, but for horn, no, you do not need a pop filter for French horn unless you're blowing so much air that it's coming out of your embouchure and hitting the microphone. Generally, the pop filter is just to stop wind from getting in there. So you're probably not pushing out enough wind in your bell to really need to worry about it. Um, great. And best USB mic for horn, probably the Yeti Blue. Uh, probably the Yeti Blue. How much time do you give yourself to record when you have a deadline? Uh, you know, I mean, this is always a thing that you have to balance because you need time to practice. So <laughs> you don't want to do it too early because you want to be able to practice and do something great. Um, but I generally say like a week out. If you can get a recording done a week before the deadline, you'll be, you'll be um, solid. And that's usually what I try to do. Have you ever found a mic or setup that you recommend we avoid? I really have not found something that I haven't been able to make sound um, good. What I would recommend you avoid, though, is um, don't even bother with your onboard um, computer microphone and don't use your phone. Do not use your phone microphone. It is not good enough for the horn. Um, it, it'll work for, you know, um, for, for really quick, I need to see how I sound and check my rhythm and stuff, but I, I wouldn't trust your phone's uh, microphone to do that. But generally any other microphone, I think you can do a great job. For setting up those different mic arrangements, do you just measure the distance and angles or do you have some kind of special brackets that hold the mic? Um, I don't have it with me, but I do have a special bracket that holds the mic. So um, in when you start to use those pairs of microphones, you'll need to get something called a stereo bar. And that's just something that mounts both the microphones on them Rode has one that has all of the markings on it that tells you exactly how, like how many centimeters apart all the microphones are and stuff. And I use that to judge, but I also do keep a tape measurer um, around all of my microphones so that I can manually measure it. The angles, um, I just, you know, I it's just mainly doing some trigonometry to make sure that the angles are right. I'm not actually check, but if the distances are correct and they're, you know, they're parallel to the stereo bar, then the angle will almost always work out. I'm just doing some <laughs> some high school math uh, generally gets you the angle right. And, off, and 90 degrees is also a very common angle that you have to use and that one's pretty easy um, just to test with a piece of paper. How do you fix gain buzz and finding the right volume? So this is the thing I was talking about, about setting it to negative 12 before. Um, if it's too loud, there's nothing you can do to fix that buzzing, um, that distorting. You have to um, You have to do it before you record. Preferred audio editing software. Logic is the only one I really know how to use, um, so I definitely would recommend that, but Pro Tools uh, is great. Um, even Adobe has one, Adobe Audition, that's that's actually pretty good, even though a lot of people don't use it. And then um, Audacity is probably perfect to get started because it's free um, and it's not too complicated to use, and there's a lot of tutorials involved in it that will show you how to do a lot of this stuff. So generally, are you using separate video and audio for recording? Uh, yes, I actually will bring this up at the end of the presentation in, in one of the later slides, but um, control, quality and control are connected to each other. The more things you can control independently, the higher quality the recording is gonna be. Having a camera that just does video, gonna get you the best video. Microphones that just do um, microphones, you know, there you go. Um, just do audio, you'll get the best audio. Having a separate lighting. Keeping everything separate makes you have more control, more quality. So let's talk about video for a little bit. Um, video is certainly the most confusing, I think. It was at least hard for me to start because my ears are a lot better than my eyes. Um, at least they've been trained a lot better than my eyes. So it was harder for me to figure out how if something looked right or looked good. Um, but there are some tricks and stuff that you should know about cameras and video recording to make sure that your stuff looks and sounds great. So there's four different types of cameras that you're going to be worrying about. First of all is your cell phone. Your cell phone is probably the best camera that you have access to um, unless you have uh, one of these, uh, a DSLR um, or a camcorder. Actually, even a camcorder. Your phone is a fan. Modern phones have really great cameras. Next up are webcams. 
Um, great for Zoom calls, probably not the best for video recording. And one of the reasons for it is just so that you know, the, the webcam is so small, it doesn't have a lot of the computer parts inside that help it process the image correctly. So you get a lot of graininess, you don't really get a full 4K resolution or a full 1080p resolution. Um, they work and they're certainly better than the one that comes with your computer, um, but I think you can save your money on webcams. DSLRs are mirrorless cameras. So this is what I use, um, and this is what a lot of people use. So, you know, it looks like a, I'm not using it now because <laughs> I have to show you the camera in the video, in the presentation, but um, these cameras, uh, Canon, you know, mirrorless cameras, the Canon Rebel series, um, Nikon has some, and then Sony Alpha cameras. Um, are these, they're hybrid cameras. So they're designed to take photos and shoot videos. Um, not gonna lie, they're a little expensive. Um, there are some cheap options like the Canon M50, M50, um, which comes in this whole creator kit where you get a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but cameras can get really expensive. That being said, these mirrorless and DSLR cameras look great and they're actually not too hard to use. And the last one are camcorders um, and like GoPros. And these are cameras specifically designed for video, but they usually don't have interchangeable lenses. And like I was saying earlier about control and quality, when you don't have an interchangeable lens, you're stuck with what's on the camera. You can't customize it in the future and you better hope that it looks good when you purchase it. Now, if you get like a 4K camcorder and you're spending you know, several hundred dollars on it, it's probably gonna look fine and it's gonna be great to use. Um, but, you know, something to think about. But just like how microphone placement is more important than the actual gear you have, framing and lighting uh, and these these sorts of accessories are actually more important than the camera in some ways. So lighting um, is, pr I, learning learning good lighting will fix just about any recording that you need to make. Um, this is everything from knowing not to sit in front of a window um, because the window is going to put a bunch of light in the camera and it's going to wash out the image, flipping that around so that the window is facing you. Um, whatever your subject is should always be front lit. Um, that should be the thing that most of the light in the room is focused on. Ring lights are great for this purpose um, if you have them. And if you do buy like more like larger LED lights, um, as long as they're by color, which means that you can change the color um, to be warm or cool um, from like a white color to a yellow color, then you're pretty much good to go. Uh, and they, they'll work just fine. Um, you want to be able to change the color of the lights because, you know, for example, my room, my lamps have all these really yellow lights. And so um, I need my LED lights to look that same color for all the camera stuff to work out. Um, but it's generally a good idea not to mix colors um, in this way. And then the other thing is, you know, tripods. So you need, your camera needs to sit on a tripod. And if you're going to use your phone, you can buy a phone tripod. In fact, the cheapest camera you can probably buy is a, a $30 tripod from Amazon. Uh, yeah, from Amazon uh, that will, uh, you know, you put your phone on that all of a sudden, your phone is going to look even better because you can set it up, you can get the frame, you can get the shot, um, and it'll look great. And you can really take advantage of your phone's cameras. Generally, when you're framing it, you want to keep the camera at about eye level or a little bit higher. Nobody looks good um, from underneath. That's just not a look that we like. You know, generally we like like when we're in the center of the frame and we're we're looking head on, kind of like this. So you can even just like you know, move your head around and practice and see what looks good. Um, obviously, it's a little different because I have this in front of me, so it's going to make me look like a, a Dracula or some movie villain if I get too close to it. Awesome. So a couple of things to keep in mind for video. First, clean your room. <laughs> if you need an interesting but not distracting background, um, having this is also just good advice for auditions. If you're doing a video audition, the, the proctors are going to look at, at all this other stuff and it's things you got to keep in mind. Is it unfair that it's not about the music all the time? Maybe, but clean your room. Uh, it's always saying front light the subject. The brightest object should be your face. Um, yes, that's, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Not your horn, your face. Um, avoid natural light. Um, natural light looks great. 
until it changes, until a cloud goes over and messes with your recording. Um, not a huge deal, uh, honestly, but something to keep in mind, especially if you're using like a DSLR or a, you know a really big camera, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that the lighting isn't changing because that means that the camera settings aren't gonna be correct for what you're doing. Um, and then when you're in the frame, prioritize your face, don't cut off your head. And if you do a wide shot, make sure that you get your entire body in the frame or at least the entire French horn. Um, so, you know, this wouldn't really be great for an audition. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to record this way because I'm too close to the camera. My horn is going to get cut off. People can't see what my hand's doing down here. Um, and generally it just doesn't give you a good impression of who I am or, or where I am, right? A space. It's a really tight shot. I would probably go out into my living room where I have more room to set up, to put the camera further away from me and really make sure that I'm visible entirely in the frame. You also though need to know about some editing stuff, um, for video software. So just like audio, there's some software you need to know. The basics of this are, you know, Windows Movie Maker and iMovie uh, work fine as long as the only thing you're doing is trimming the video and syncing audio video. If you need to do literally anything else, you need to get Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro. Um, generally, Movie Maker and iMovie limit you to one graphic or two clips at a time, which means that you can't, if you want, if you need to put two sentences <laughs> on the video, you're not going to be able to do it. Um, or if you need to trim multiple clips together, um, if it's more than two, it's just not going to work um, very easily. Uh, and it, it, trust me, it's one of those things that it, is it kind of scary to need to make an expensive purchase for software? Yes, but is it save you a lot of time if this is going to be something you're doing regularly? Absolutely, I, I really do recommend um, trying to upgrade at least to the Adobe suite, which is a monthly subscription. Um, it's about 20 bucks a month if you're an educator or a student. Um, and then Final Cut and Logic come together in one bundle for MacBooks uh, for about $200 um, that you can buy for if you're an educator or a student. Things to keep in mind. So the other big question that I get is how to sync audio and video. Basically what you just need to do is look here at the waveforms and line them up and then play back the video and just make sure it's synced. Um, it really helps if you clap either at the beginning or the ending because then you have that one waveform to line up. However, there's an even easier method and that's to get Final Cut Pro. Um, sorry, PC users, you don't have access to this feature, but if you have um, a MacBook and you have Final Cut Pro, you literally just click on the video clip and the audio clip, you right click, and then there's, a, there's a, um, an option that says synchronize clips and it will, it will just do it automatically. Uh, you don't even have to do it. But it only works, by the way, if the audio and the video are both at a sample rate of 48 kilohertz. Um, if, you, if it doesn't work, it'll get close, but it won't be perfect. Um, so sample rate is important. <laughs> Great, and then just some other software tips that you should be aware of. Again, these are not things that you need to memorize or gonna make it break. They're things that you should know about before you get started. Um, so when you do get into your software, check for the option to, to create proxy media of your footage. If you are recording 4K video, um, your computer might not be able to handle processing 4K video, but it might be able to handle a proxy video of 4K and then render it at the end. So that will make editing go a lot smoother and it will free up your computer to not catch on fire while you're recording. Um, optimize your resolution for your platform. So basically what this means is whatever um, your uh, res like if you recorded in 4K, make sure that you have the 4K <laughs> resolution selected in your video editing software. But if you're recording for like Instagram uh, or TikTok or stories or anything like that, they have specific resolutions that you need to use. So YouTube um, 16 by nine, that's widescreen. That's the 4K option, that's the 1080p, that sort of thing. Instagram uses a five by four aspect ratio or a one to one, which is a square. These are options you can set as you're editing your video to make sure that you're only gonna export um, a, that rectangle that's five by four or a square. And then TikTok, Instagram Reels or Instagram Stories are a nine by 16, which is just that 4K image rotated. Um, 
One other thing that I never thought in my life I would need to have an opinion about, <laughs> which is video codec files and stuff like that, uh, is uh, this H. Uh, it's I think I wrote two six four, but I'm not actually sure if that's anyway. The H. Two six four is the highest quality for the smallest file. Um, now, yeah, now my brain is thinking if it's six two four or two six four. I think it's two six four, um, but that is that option is going to give you the highest quality at a small file it's going to keep your file sizes really low um, my story with this when i auditioned for the um, pacific music festival um, a couple years ago um, i had no idea about this codec i didn't know that you could change it i just did whatever the default setting was on imovie um, and i recorded in 4k so i ended up uploading to um, accepted <laughs> um, a 10 gigabyte file <laughs> and i actually i met sarah willis later and she was like scott i cannot believe it. it took it took me like a whole day in my you know hotel wi-fi it took like nine hours to download that video and um when i went and re-exported it later uh it it went from being 10 gigabytes to about 700 megabytes which is drastically smaller so definitely something that you want to do especially if you're going to be storing this stuff uh, on your computer um, and then, yeah, use a, the other thing, if you're going to do serious video work, um, it save yourself some trouble and get an external hard drive. Um, it's just a good it, video files are huge. Um, and render files are, are big. So you want to have something that you can use just to, um, keep all that stuff off your computer, make your computer run faster and save yourself a lot of trouble. So a couple more things that I want to go over. This is a thing, control and quality. So keep everything separate. Keep your video, your audio, your lighting, all of that stuff separate. Um, yes, um, for example, a great one, uh, Shure has, a, the microphone company Shure has a microphone called the MV88. It sounds great, except it has to be attached to your phone to work, which means that if you're recording video with your phone, you can't get an ide the ideal video placement and the ideal microphone placement are going to be two different locations. So it's a great microphone, but it's actually really hard to use. Uh, it's something you want to think about. Practice and experiment. Again, you learn this stuff by doing. Um, you can read every tutorial you want, but really like getting in there and trying to ask yourself, like, what am I trying to do? How do I get this graphic to show up? How do I make the sheet music appear on the video? How do I trim the recording how to you know all that kind of stuff that that's the stuff that you ask those questions and then you know what you need to google um a lot of people a lot of people have asked um, these questions before uh we've asked them and uh it's a great idea to look there because <laughs> people everyone's had these questions before the answers are out there and finally um, i'm going to answer some questions here don't worry but um, I'm just gonna send you my pages here. So everything is just Scott Legere Horn. Um, you'll find me on Instagram, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Facebook. I'm at the New World Symphony uh, in Miami Beach, Florida, where I'm streaming from now. And uh, it's been really great to present to y'all today. I hope that some of these basics are gonna be useful and that you will start creating content because um, I have found, as my last point, that sharing uh, being able to create my own music, even if it's just recording etudes, um, and being able to share that with people on my own terms has been really fulfilling um, and has uh, made me kind of like really appreciate that part of making art. That fact that you get to make something and then you can share it with other people. And so I, I obviously make sure that you're sharing your best playing and that you're really proud of what you're sharing. Um, and hopefully these tips and these tools will help you make recordings that you're proud of and that you want to share with people. But that's really what it's all about. You know, it's being able to make music in your home and it's being able to feel good about the music that you're making and want to share it with people. So I will answer a couple more questions now. Um, I think if there are new questions, if there are new questions, please answer them. <laughs> what is the best way to frame horn playing since it's asymmetrical okay so this is something i didn't get into um and jimmy transitioned to an instagram <laughs> maybe i will um one of these things uh, the best way to frame horn playing since it's asymmetrical 
is um, using the rule of thirds. So if you keep yourself to the left or the right, um, you actually don't need to be in the middle of the frame, and then you can let your horn do the rest of it. Um, is this what I'm talking about? Yes, that link is what I'm talking about. There's an Apple Pro bundle. What's the mic I'm using right now? A Rode NT1A, and thank you. It's been really helpful. So it's been great presenting. Um, thank you all so much, and I will turn it back over to John now to do the rest.